Hi, my name is Georgia Waters and I play Eliza in Freeform Siren, as well as Rose in Toys of Terror, and you're watching the film Craziest Show. Awesome. And I am Daniel, the host of the film Craziest Show. It's great to have you here, Georgia. Pleasure to be here. I have like two sheets of questions here. So I figured we'd start with Siren and then transition to Toys of Terror at the end. Yeah. Um, so my first one for Siren is just when you were hired for it, um, did you know that you were going to be on for two seasons or what was the plan for your character? No, I didn't. Um, and I just thought it would be one episode. Um, that's all they kind of would tell us. They said with the potential of more episodes, um, I wasn't really sure. And it was all very mysterious as well. Um, you know, they never show you feature scripts. So you kind of, I mean, it, reading the script, it was like, well, I feel like there'll be more because they introduce these new mermaid characters and it'd be strange not to then have them in any future episodes. But uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, as a creative, you never want to get your hopes up too much in case uh, that's not the case. But um, yeah, it was, I didn't realize what a huge thing it would become. Oh, that's, that's really neat because just like coming into this, uh, like already established world of Bristol Cove with all like the mythology, what, what was that like only thinking that you'd only be on for the one episode? Um, well then on, uh, on day one of filming, it was very clear that uh, it wasn't just going to be day one. Okay. Uh, I think that was more for, you know, they, they don't want to over promise. Um, okay, fair enough. Contractual stuff. But uh, so then day one, um, Aline, who plays Ren, the kind of the lead mermaid, she uh, took us, the, I think there was like six new mermaid cast and um, we did a, a whole day of mermaid workshopping, which was her getting us to visualize. She did a kind of um, meditation with us, which kind of took us through the, what it would be like to be swimming underwater then on land. And then we did a workshopping of all the physicality the way they would speak and so yeah she she was very generous in making sure we felt very comfortable with the mythology and because it's a very specific type of mermaid in Bristol Cove it's not uh kind of your Disney version that you'd be used to they're very much predators um and these lethal beings that at the switch can suddenly tear someone's throat out um so it was important that we were all on board with that world because she'd spent so long in the first season establishing that world that when you introduce new mermaids it's so important that they inhabit that as well. Um, I thought that was like the most interesting part here just with like you, if you grew up on a little mermaid or even aquamarine um, yeah. and then you just see this more vicious like raw like, like you say predators like that's just an interesting idea to see on screen what was it like exploring that and just playing one of them? Uh, I, I absolutely loved it. I, well, I watched all of season one before auditioning. Um, so I already knew that that world and that, that I found really exciting because you usually get these like lulling mermaids on the side of a rock um, looking very coy and beautiful. And then suddenly being able to play these dangerous beings was really interesting where um, I guess you have that that enigmatic energy, which would draw people in as well, but then you're playing that undercurrent of aggression or potential aggression. Um, my character is slightly different because she is a, a healer as well. So she's not as aggressive as the other mermaids. She has a, a lot more empathy, more curiosity. Her first instinct isn't to protect and kill, it's more to, to heal. So even with meeting some of the humans, she kind of, she can sense their pain because that's what we did a lot of discussions about how being a healer what that would be like and a lot of it was she can feel when other people are, are suffering um so then suddenly seeing that in humans that means that she was more perhaps more understanding whereas the other ones would always see, see them as a threat okay so i'm realizing now that like like when you, when your character first meets uh, Brendan Fletcher's character, I thought that yeah. was like, oh, maybe they know each other. But now I'm just realizing that he has so much trauma that she's like, oh, I need to help you kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess she also senses that he's part 
merman as well because he's a sure hybrid um so i guess she sensed it but yeah it's his pain so very much um she can feel the pain and she wants to help him and i guess he's his character as well he's always been very closed about his pain so having this uh creature or being understand what he's feeling i think was a, a very powerful moment between them cool and i i thought it was interesting too like how there's like that one scene where you're in the water and it kind of plays out like Jaws in a way, just like trying to get them out of the water and you're just swimming around when everyone else is just kind of like really aggressive. Well, yeah. what was it like filming that scene? Just, I think your first one in water as well. Um, we had a lot of training, which is good. Um, so we did have, we did scuba training, free diving training, uh, breath hold uh, practice. So we, we felt very, uh, ready for it um, and then yeah first time under the water was definitely an experience because you can't see anything um, you're very um, blind because you don't have any goggles or anything and it, there's a lot of chlorine to keep it clean um, so they've got speakers underneath the water where the director's speaking through so you're you're listening to the direction underwater <laughs> um, so it was it was definitely quite a huge experience but um yeah, it was fun, I guess, playing part predator, but then also holding back because I guess my, my character would be more to heal others if they get injured rather than attack. That's really funny. Just like, yeah, going underwater and hearing the director being like, okay, swim here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and face this, you, because you can't see, you can't quite tell if you're looking in the right direction either. So they would often be like, no, to the left to the left and you're like oh yeah. <laughs> okay now I think I'm pretty sure your character wore contact lenses so is that did that make it harder to see as well yeah I think all of us wore contact lenses and then underwater you have specific contact lenses which I think are designed to be uh slightly wider um and then so Obviously, when you're free diving, sometimes they would fall out and then you'd have to stop. And then one of the uh, safety divers would have to go and find your tiny contact lens, bring it up. Um, and there was one scene where mine split in two somehow once they found it, it torn in two. So I'm not really sure what happened there. But yeah. yeah. And then on land, because I, I don't wear contact lenses in normal uh, day to day. The obviously the the color bit doesn't change. So adapting your eyes can be quite difficult. So I remember the first day of filming, even on land with contact lenses, everything was slightly blurry. Um, you do get used to it after a while, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of physical challenges definitely with the role. Okay, and now I'm pretty sure you probably, you, you probably get this like in every interview, but did, did you have to be a good swimmer for this role? Yeah, we did. Um, that was a big stipulation before even auditioning, they they wanted to ensure that we we're strong swimmers. Um, and even though I'm a very comfortable swimmer, I used to swim competitively, there's a difference between swimming and being comfortable in the water in this way. And I'm really glad we had the training because you're under the water, you're strapped down with weights. So you couldn't just swim up to the top always and you've got to, you can't see anything. You're relying for a safety diver to give you the scuba to then put into your mouth. And to stay calm and you can be under there for a long time and then you you give the scuba away do the scene and then you take it back um so that it is you have to be very comfortable if you're at all on edge with being underwater that there's no way you can play the role okay that just hearing that that gives me anxiety like uh oh yeah the, uh, and actually the instructor she said that we should do a lot of yoga to practice getting ourselves into a yen, a zen state because a lot of it is also in the mind um with holding your breath if you start to panic you lose your breath a lot more quickly so just being able to practice being very zen and on a film set when you're getting direction and you're on a tight time deadline um yeah that, those days were both amazing and also one of the most challenging ones now Obviously, uh, you had like an acting audition, but did you have a swimming audition as well? Or did they just kind of take your word for it? They did want to do a swim audition, but I think when I got cast, they didn't have enough time because 
they I think I did the audition on a Saturday and then they offered the role on a Wednesday and then by Friday we were filming so um yeah and the timeline I think they had there was speculation my agent was like oh I think they want to do a swim test and then like they don't have time so <laughs> they're gonna trust that you know how to swim I was like um but yeah, if you didn't and you got uncertain, it's obvious that you weren't comfortable, then I think you'd be in a lot of trouble. And so would your agent. So um, okay. yeah. I feel like I would lie on my CV like, yeah, no, I mean, I didn't. Cause I think I only made it to like level 11 in swim lessons, uh, or, like, okay. maybe less. Cause I think 11 is pretty good. Maybe like level eight. So like, I'd be yeah. like, yeah, yeah, I, I can swim. I can swim I fine. Can I've been in water. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in awesome. water. Yeah. Right. <laughs> also, I just wanted to ask, um, just sometimes I know that the fans can have like an influence of like wanting to see more of your character with Eliza and just, well, I think it's fair to say that she starts out as kind of like a side player. And yeah. so what was it like trying to like get the fans attention and be like, hey, like you want to see more of me? Um, I guess I never thought about that, which is interesting. Maybe I should have done, but I think it was more I was in love with the character and wanted to find the little moments that she could show that make you want to find out more and spark that curiosity in the audience because um, I think it was Rena who plays Helen said, just focus on what is being captured by the camera. That's, that's all you can control. You can play all these mind games and try and attract the fans attention, but she's like, just focus on the work. And then if you do a good job with the work, then they'll capture more of you. So um, yeah, that, I mean, that's been great advice and advice I would take forward to any project is focus on the work and then the rest will come. Okay, I, I love that. And also just, um, yeah, cause there's some, some, some moments where you just don't have a lot of, some scene, some episodes where you don't have a lot of dialogue, but you can see your compassion in like your role mm -hmm. and just, yeah. um, you have to be extra expressive. Was that an interesting challenge? Yeah, definitely. And almost kind of a, an exciting tool for a, an actor to use, um, especially because when they're first online on land, they, they don't know how to talk properly. So using uh, facial expressions. And we did, um, we did workshop that a fair bit, um, but then I kind of took it further with how do you show that someone's interested in what you have to say or curious about you um, in just in their facial expressions? Um, and I guess I, I thought a bit about how therapists would work as well, because therapists try not to talk, but they want to show they're listening. So I guess using that. And uh, I think we did things of like, um, sometimes to face your ear closer to someone shows that you're listening or, um, yeah, it, it was really interesting working with the physicality a bit okay I'm, I'm that's just kind of funny to me because like I'm trying to show it like that I'm like, actively yeah. listening but, like and just being like nodding like I almost felt like I should like yeah put my ear closer there <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah as an interview obviously you, you have to do that a lot the the workshop you keep referencing with like Elena I think is the actress's name yeah yeah Aline Aline sorry with her teaching you how to to speak in that kind of clipped way that the mermaids speak. What well, what was that like trying to get used to that? Yeah, it took a while. And um, luckily Aline is so generous that uh, before my character had quite a few lines that we sat down on one of the weekends and just went through and uh, I recorded her just so I could match her intonation. Um, and we did agree that it's good for the mermaids to have like slightly different, they don't have to be exactly the same accent but that it has to kind of, the way she described it is if it, it's coming from the sea within you. So that's why it's kind of like the lilting and the forwards and backwards uh, to kind of mimic the waves. But um, she also watched a lot of um, Bjork. And so I watched a lot of those interviews as well. Um, and the way she, Bjork speaks is amazing. So uh, yeah kind of researching different ways of doing it and then finding your own path, especially because Eliza is a healer. So she would be a lot more gentle and, and less aggressive um, and less clipped than 
and the other one makes. Okay, so just like the way you speak of it, of it like sounds really poetic with like the the waves. So that's that's interesting. Yeah. So a little bit extra for Eliza in that way. Yeah, and coming through this like through the stomach and letting it be more of a physical thing rather than trying to focus on the sounds necessarily as well. I really found the like how we talked earlier about how they're kind of like predators. I re I found I really mm -hmm. found it interesting how there's like that wolf pack dynamic between Rin and uh, Katrina. Yeah, so yeah. what was it like having a kind of a front row seat to that? It was great. And um, well, in real life, they're very close friends and got on very well. Um, so it was quite fun seeing. And I think sometimes to play true enemies, you have to be a uh, good friend so that you're comfortable inhabiting that space. Um, but yeah, it was interesting in terms of being part of the pack and where you have your affinity to and uh, the different mummies, we all kind of chose which side. Eliza, strong Rin from the beginning. Um, and then some of the others were Team Katrina. But uh, yeah, it was quite fun playing with that in the green room, uh, what team you were on. Um, but yeah, it was interesting seeing the kind of the two matriarchs battle together. Um, butt heads and yeah, they become quite devious as well in the way that they play that out. Okay. Yeah, because it's kind of like siren civil war in a way. Yes, especially in season three. Okay. All right, fair I, enough. I don't know if I want to share spoilers, but yeah, it, uh, it becomes um, more about the, the wars between the different pods because then you, you realize that our little pod isn't the only mermaid pod. It, it's kind of, there's different types of mermaids throughout all the scene and um, it becomes a battle between all the different pods. Okay, so just a much bigger world, okay. Yeah, a much bigger world. Um, similar to how the, the world on land, there's you know different countries, different cultures. Um, I think the writers really want to explore that in the sea, you can have that as well. Okay. Now, now I'll, I'll be honest. I had only watched uh, six episodes of the second season, so I, oh, yeah. I don't know much yeah. about the third season. But I was just curious, like, and I don't know if this is ever shown later in Eliza's character. Mm -hmm. But did did you ever get to discover your own siren song? Um, I don't think Eliza did. She does. She heals with um, sound a lot, but it's more of a humming. So um, I did a lot of humming and I, I'm, I'm terrible at singing. So that might have come into why <laughs> we did more humming. And I think uh, it was quite interesting because the first time I healed someone, I, we talked about doing a type of song. And I think I chose to just do the humming because I was like, I can manage that. Uh, doing an elaborate song like Aline uh, Rin has, there's no way I would be able to do that. So. Um, yeah, the, the kind of the, the healing harm that is what Eliza sticks to. Okay, did, did, did you want to do a little bit of the healing hum now? Well, I don't know if I'd want to put your, your viewers through that, but it's a very simple, just like, and then sometimes it changes key. Um, but I quite like the idea that Eliza has more of her her healing sound rather than the siren song because the siren song is about luring um, outsiders in and it's more of a, a predatory attacking thing rather than uh, soothing I guess. Okay cool now now you you saying like luring that made me think of another mermaid film called The Lure which is like, seems a little bit darker like were were those kind of films given to you as homework for this or no not really? They weren't actually um and maybe maybe Aline might have done, but we we looked more at uh, animals. So um, the way, say, like sharks move in the sea, or um, I I took a lot of inspiration from like large cats and the way that they move and how they can look very relaxed and then suddenly they're on edge and they can attack. Um, so we we stuck more to what is in the animal world rather than previous um, films and and television. Now, with this, with this being uh, filmed in Vancouver, and I know you're based in Vancouver now, 
Yeah. Was was this like a decision to move to Vancouver or how, how'd you moved there before? Kind of a, a lucky situation in that I, I had a, I had just moved um, and the decision had already been made. So I was living in London before and I lived in London for about four years and I was, I was just ready for a change. I'd gone to LA for a bit and um, met some actors who were actually from Vancouver and then I just started researching it's like oh Vancouver seems like a great place to live and I can work in the city um so yeah it, it kind of made sense as a move and yeah I haven't looked back I, I love living in Vancouver okay nice yeah because I, I personally I've never been I'm, I'm from Ottawa but mm. I know some of my buddies who have gone out to British Columbia and they won't come back because it's just so yeah. nice out there it is and in Vancouver you've got the sea and beaches um, and then you've got the mountains um, so you know you can be playing beach volleyball whilst looking up at the, the snow-capped mountains and yeah it's and then you know the next thing you could be going off to film so yeah it's it's pretty awesome because in London often when you're working on something it's not always in the city it'll be all over the place so it's quite nice being in it a city where so much is actually being filmed here. Brilliant, cool. Now, I have a last one for Siren. Um, and I just wanted to ask if, if you had like a favorite character moment for Eliza or just favorite moment shared with like a cast member. Um, I guess there's, I have two favorites. Okay. One uh, is with Aline in I think season two, episode 12. Um, where we have a, a special moment. Um, I'm worried about the lack of next generation nannies and she said it will it will come. And then we put our heads together and that felt like a lovely moment. And it was a beautiful day filming as well together. And then um, in season three, I have a lot of beautiful moments with uh, Helen. So our relationship develops in terms of I think it's a kind of a friendship, but also a kind of a, almost a mother daughter, almost a friendship where um, we're kind of imparting wisdom to each other. And I think it's, it's quite nice to see uh, their intimacy and how Eliza feels, I don't want to do any spoilers, but she kind of feels um, Helen's pain as well and wants to ease it and she wants to help Helen. So, um, yeah, they have some some really nice moments in, of trust. Um, and that leads, when things go wrong, Helen turns to Eliza and she's like, you can help us. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed getting those moments and working with Ren is amazing because she's she's such a fantastic actress. Yeah, I actually did see the clip of you doing like the the head thing with Ren, which was just yeah. great. I love that moment. and. And I definitely got the sense from the episodes of episodes that I watched that you worked very closely with Rena, who plays Helena. Or yeah, Helena. yeah. And I think um, perhaps the writers caught that as well. So then they were like, "Oh, we'll add more of that in because they've obviously got a good chemistry between them and an under understanding." Because uh, Helen also she does a lot of home medical remedies, so I think they have that interest as well, that shared thing about healing. That's so cool. I, I got to watch more. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great show. I, I mean, I, when I was auditioning, I was only meant to watch like one episode, but then I ended up watching all of them for auditioning. Yeah, happy how that happens, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so now I'll, I'll just transition into your other film, Toys of Terror. Mm -hmm. And just, um, I just want to ask what, what attracted you to television for Siren and then also what, what made you want to venture into the horror genre with Toys of Terror? I think it was the character of Rose I found really interesting because when I was auditioning I knew that she had lost a child um, but then she was here in this nanny role and I thought that was really interesting that you've, you've gone through something so traumatic of losing your own child but then you're there looking after other people's children. So I think having that as the basis of something to explore was really interesting um and then the the moments itself she had some really beautiful moments throughout the script so that really appealed and then this, the kind of the mystical supernatural element as well um i don't personally i get quite scared so i 
I'm very bad at watching horror. Um, but I, I really liked her story and her character. And um, originally she was going to be British when I auditioned. So um, I think there was something in that as like, because she had moved to America, I was like, oh, it's like me, you know, moving uh, over to North America. Um, but then they wanted her to be American. So it lost that element. But uh, yeah, I really identified with the character. Okay, is it is it is it tricky doing an American accent for you, or not? It's just natural. Now it's not. I did I did have to work on it before, but uh, yeah, I I guess it's one of those living in Vancouver. I most of my auditions are with an American accent, so uh, from doing all the auditions, you you pick it up very quickly. Okay, do you ever like trick people like like oh I'm British but now I'm American kind of thing. I haven't. Uh, I've got a friend who does that. She's like, don't you just go around speaking with an American accent? And I was like, no, I, I'm too honest. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I should. Um, good practice to see if people pick it up. Like, see, like if you want to, for the rest of the conversation, if you ever want to do it, just like see if I notice even. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Little you know, I'm British, so if you... <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Little April Fool's joke, maybe. <laughs> Should have started with the American accent. Yeah, <laughs> and then just transition like, oh wait, what just happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, is there like a big difference in your prep for both of these characters? Um, yeah, doing a film and doing a TV is really different because um, with TV, it's two weeks at a time as an episode, so you're kind of focusing on that one episode, and then with the film. Uh, it was all, you know, you do kind of location by location. So you could be doing scenes that were from the end of the film, from the beginning of the film in the, the one location. And um, because I, as a lead role, you've got so many more lines and different parts of the story to tell. So um, that was definitely a new challenge in that I'd have to make sure I knew all the lines for the week ahead on the Sunday night. Um, just because you'd finish filming at like 3 a.m. and then you've got to be on set again by 8 a.m. And so there's not enough time in between to, to learn the lines for the next day. So just making sure the weekends before that you're, you basically know it all. So then it's just a refresh on the actual day. So um, yeah, in terms of television and film, that felt quite different. The amount of material you're going through each week. Okay, all right. Now, with your, with your character, Rose, just you saying that she's a nanny. And I just, the sense I got from her was like, yeah, like she has like this extra compassion where kids are her life. And she she reads a lot of bedtime stories. So I'm I'm just kind of curious, like, did you have a favorite bedtime story growing up? I read to myself a lot growing up. Um, I'm trying to think of my favorite one. I mean, I loved Harry Potter. I... Sure. And I, I was the right age where um, I was kind of Harry Potter's age as the books came out. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely loved that one. And in terms of nursery rhymes, I can't really remember. Um, yeah, uh, too long ago for that. I mean, I loved all the Disney films and I, I loved all the, um, I guess the Brothers Grimm versions of those, the more original, which are actually really dark, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay I, I i feel like see the like harry potter was a big thing for my my childhood even <laughs> like with the movies coming out but i imagine like how much bigger it must have been in britain right yeah huge um i actually wrote to jk rowling asking if i could be in the film but she said she did do, she did do a reply but she said um she can't control that i had to do the studio direction but uh 11 year old me didn't get that far. <laughs> okay, did, did you did you ever audition? No, I didn't, I didn't. Okay. I, I was just excited to get a reply from her. But um, yeah, I, I loved Harry Potter. Okay, no letter from Hogwarts, Hogwarts. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I, I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, also, I just, I'm all, for, for films that are kind of set in haunted houses, I'm always curious about the energy was mm -hmm. did, did, did the house feel haunted that you were filming in or what was that like no it didn't at all um 
because the art department made it look like the way it does. In, in real life, I think it, it looked very modern on the inside. Um, so like, you know, nice cream walls. And then the art department came in and made it look like it was crumbling and falling apart. So yeah, the energy definitely wasn't there. Um, for Siren, we had, there's a old hospital that we did a few scenes in and that, um, that definitely had a horrible energy to it. And lots of people, everyone who's filmed in that location all says that they think it's, it's haunted there. But um, no, for Toys of Terror, definitely it, it was a, a nice atmosphere. You never felt scared walking down a corridor on your own. It was a, a warm feeling, I'd say. Okay, I love that. Just absolutely no terror in the horror movie, but just really good yeah. hospital and siren. Yeah, exactly, exactly. For the ones that was meant to be like, because the, the hospital scenes, not to you know, be a, a nice clinical place of where people are getting better, but in reality, that was the most uh, chilling place to film. Okay, and I, I feel like that must have disturbed uh, Eliza being a, hear, a healer as well. Yeah, getting all these different feelings from all directions. Yeah, fair. Now, also, just with the toys of terror, toys of terror, um, just with their design, did you have a favorite toy, or could you pick just one? Um, I liked the dragon. Um, I, don't, I can't remember. And um, and the bee. The bee was like creepy and had this strange little smile. Um, yeah, they they're all quite creepy in real life. Uh, they did a really good job of um, designing these. Okay, yeah, I I really liked um, Uncle Monkey, but I f I feel like I wouldn't want to go near him on set. No. Yeah, he seemed like the most evil one, so. Yeah, it wasn't my favorite in terms of the, the destruction he caused. Okay, so so that was, so would he be your one that's like, okay, I don't want to be a, in a room alone with this guy? No, yeah, Uncle Monkey wouldn't. He, and you'd get the sense that he's always watching you as well, so. Yeah, and also just, what, what was it? Because I know you, um, I think the gargoyle or flying dragon thing was, mm. it was a dragon? A dragon, yeah. Okay, for some reason I thought gargoyle, but dragon makes a lot more sense. Um, what was it like interacting with that toy and just in general, what was it like interacting with the toys on set? So um, whenever you interact with the toys, they'd kind of do it in two stages. One where um, we had puppeteers on set who would kind of do the movement with you, so you'd kind of block the movement and then you'd have to do it again without the puppet there, so that for the, I guess for the CGI. Um, and yeah, that was definitely an experience having to be attacked by something that's not there. Um, and I, I've not kind of done it underwater with Siren, but not not um, to this level where it's literally just you and having a battle. Um, but yeah, I kind of was like, okay, I've just got to throw this everything at it so it looks as re realistic as possible. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because you're not you've got to kind of remember where it was going to be uh, when you're re responding. So uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely an interesting experience. Okay, you, you, you give it your, sorry, you give it your all though. Cause yeah. like, but what's your imagination like? Is that is that tricky trying to be like, okay, so this is the dragon's mark kind of thing? Yeah, it's a mixture of uh, imagination and technical uh, visualization as well, I guess, cause you've got to, build the, the danger of the moment, but also making sure that you remember when and where you were being attacked. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a mixture of both. Um, I guess I wouldn't be an actor if I didn't indulge in my imagination. <laughs> That's fair. Um, but what was it like uh, just kind of watching the finished product, which is with the voices and just how they look on screen and sent, like opposed to how they looked on set? Yeah, it was completely different because the, the voices and uh, the little songs they do, um, obviously that wasn't quite in the script, so you, you're not really sure what to expect. I thought they weren't going to sound as uh, upbeat as they do. I think that adds to the, the sinister level that they do sound like just from a kid's TV show. Um, it was great. I mean, the director would send us little updates um, of when they were editing things together. So I'd kind of had a a few clips of what it was going to sound like but uh yeah I didn't know the full picture and then especially when you're interacting with them so 
yeah, it was cool to see it all, all come together properly. Okay, yeah, and just, and just you saying how they kind of sound um, like wacky in a way, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. It's kind of interesting how I felt a lot of the film kind of played it very straight, but then when the toys came to life, there was just like, yeah, let's just let's just go wacky with it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't know if that's because they cast the voices of the, the toys like after we'd finished filming. Um, so maybe they were kind of leaning into a different mood for that. And I think it, it is surprising as a watcher when, when those moments happen, because you're kind of expecting this like grotesque, aggressive, uh, I don't know, dark voice, but then you get these kind of like small childlike voices. Um, and I think that kind of adds to the unnervingness of it. I feel like the dark voice itself came from uh, Franklin with the, the yeah. red heart kind of head on. Yeah, so you're expecting that to be the voice that they give because um, you kind of had a glimpse of him doing that strange spectre voice. Um, and then when you do actually hear them in real life, you're like, oh, maybe they're not evil. Maybe, maybe they are just fun. Um, so you're kind of left not knowing what to think. And then, um, and then, it un unravels very quickly. <laughs> Fair, yeah, and I, I got like a lot of like Jodante Jodan influence with uh, Gremlins and especially Small Soldiers with with that one little army figure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think they wanted to create a bit of nostalgia within those characters. Uh, so yeah, I think they had a lot of fun with that. Cool, and also I think I think my favorite toy, which I, I realized like after the movie was actually like a toy in itself, was just the, the video game that Alicia plays. I uh, think it's called uh, Survivor Don't and just yeah. how the, the reality mirrors the, the game. I just, yeah, I think, yeah, and I think that was almost the creepiest part in it when you realize that she's playing the game and in a dark way, she's created some of the, the terrible things that happen because she's in control. Um, yeah, I think that I thought that was a clever moment. Yeah, I'm I'm a sucker for anything. You die in the game, you die for real. Or like yeah. a night, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street, you die in your sleep, you die for real. Yeah, which is I don't know. I think that's why everyone hates the idea that you're you think that it's make believe and that it's real. Yeah, fair enough. Now, um, you, you you said you don't. You said you kind of get spooked by horror films, did you? Yeah, um, and I love that. I really enjoy ghost stories and uh, horror films, but I get scared so easily. So I often have to like fast forward those bits. But um, yeah, it's, I guess it's one of those like love-hate relationships where I enjoy watching it, but I get scared too easily. So then I either have to hide or fast forward. Okay, but but luckily for you, this is kind of set as, at Christmas. Did you think of it more as a horror film or did you think of it more as a Christmas film? Both, I would say. Uh, but when I approached it, I guess it was more of, more of the horror in my mind. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the Christmas element is still pretty strong. Uh, actually, oh, cool. Okay, I have actually asked everything for Toys of Terror. But I figured I'd give you this opportunity to plug that screenplay you're working on if you'd like to. Yeah. Um, so I guess over the last year, probably like a lot of people, um, I, well, I started writing a few years before that. So um, I've now got uh, a feature and a pilot. And then I'm just trying to finish another feature. But um, yeah, one of the ones that I'm working on is based on my great grandmother. So um, it's kind of a personal story that I'm trying to bring to life. And so that's one of the big uh, goals of this year is to push that forwards. Okay, I won't, if you don't want to spoil it, I won't have you to, but oh, yeah, that just sounds to like a great, you know, no, fair enough. That, that's <laughs> keep it close. That seems, sounds like a great personal story. I love those yeah. kind of, kinds of passion projects. Yeah, definitely. And especially because um, my great grandmother was of that generation where women didn't really get their stories to be told and their perspectives to be told. So it's nice being able to, I mean, she's passed now, 
uh, but be able to bring that into the world in a way that she wouldn't have been able to. Okay, lovely that you can commemorate her in that way. Yeah, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to plug or anything else you wanted to add? No, that, that all sounds good. You asked some great questions. Okay, cool. So Georgia Waters, who plays Eliza in Siren, Freeform Siren, or Siren, which is now playing on Disney+, Plus, mm -hmm. as well as Rose in Toys of Terror. Thank you for chatting with me on the Film Crazy Show. Oh, thank you. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. <laughs>